Um, OK, so uh, let's start. So uh, hi, everyone. Thanks for coming. So today's lecture is about uh, deep generative models, the second part. So first of all, let's, uh, first of all, let's take a look at um, where we are now uh, in the series of lectures. So we have seen this, uh, uh, the foundations of deep learning, right? And uh, we have seen the building blocks of deep learning that are composed different the model architectures, like, like attention, like a transformer. And uh, um, in the last lecture, Eric has introduced uh, some deep generative models, like uh, GANs, like a version of the encoder, and the unified view between these different models. Um, in today's lecture, we will uh, see more uh, such deep generative models and uh, some interesting topics uh, involving like uh, uh, combining domain knowledge with neural networks. And uh, in the next lecture, we will see a case study in terms of text generation. We will see like how these models can be applied uh, in this specific domain uh, to generate like a, a sentence or generate a dialogue. Yeah, so uh, outline of the, today's lecture. In the first part, we will see uh, uh, we will see the progress of, of the game model. Um, basically, we will see some like uh, representative techniques that was uh, that were developed uh, recently to like uh, uh, improve the like uh, image generation and uh, like uh, uh, generative modeling. And in the second part, we will see a new type of deep generative models called the normalizing flow. We will visit the, con the basic concepts and the instance of this type of model called, uh, called GLOW. And uh, then uh, in the third part, we will see a topic about like integrating domain knowledge with uh, neural networks. So in this part, we are not limited in like deep generative models. We are focusing on like our basically whatever neural networks. Okay, so first part. Uh, since, the inven since the invention of game model right, in 2014, uh, we have seen like uh, many uh, many research uh, works uh, in this line. We can see like um, with this with this advances, we can get like uh, images like uh, of, of increasingly higher re resolution and uh, higher quality. And now we can get. Uh, we can generate the face images that uh, you can hardly tell like whether like, uh, this image is from a, a real photo or is, is, from the, is from the game model. Right? So let's see some representative techniques that uh, have led to this, this uh, great advances. First of all, let's do a quick recap of the, of the game model. So in game model, right, we first assume a generative model like this. Right? Uh, G is the generative model. And uh, uh, this model basically like maps the noise, noise variable Z into, into the data space X. For example, uh, Z can be a sample from a, from a Gaussian distribution. And the X is, the, for example, an image. Right? And this, uh, this process basically defines a uh, implicit distribution over X. This is a this is an implicit distribution because it's essentially a stochastic process to simulate the data X, and you can uh, you basically cannot uh, evaluate the likelihood given the data point X. Yeah, and to train this model uh, in game, we additionally uh, assume a discriminator D. So the discriminator is basically a a binary classifier, right? It won't like uh, recognize whether the input X is a is a real data or is a generated uh, image, right? And uh, for learning this model, uh, the learning is basically a a minimax game right, between the generator and the discriminator. So the discriminator is trained to, to basically to maximize the classification accuracy. Right? Uh, it wants like uh, given a given a real image, it wants uh, output label real, right? And uh, given a fake image, it will output a label fake. 
And then the generator is trained to fool this discriminator. So this is an adversarial game between, between the generator and the discriminator. And the, here are the objectives uh, for, for, for D and G, respectively. And uh, uh, in previous lectures, we have seen that all uh, these objectives, especially on uh, the optimization of the generator, is equivalent to um, minimizing this JSD, like the Jensen Shannon divergence between the data distribution and the generative distribution. Right? This is uh, the results from the original game, mo uh, game paper. And uh, in an alternative formulation, we see that um, this objective, optimizing the generator, is equivalent to minimizing this scale divergence between the generative distribution and the sum of variational posterior distribution. Right? This is the result from our uh, last lecture. Yeah, this is a very quick, uh, very quick recap of the game model. But uh, a key difficulty of this uh, of the base game model is that uh, the learning is pretty difficult. It's very unstable, and the, the generator will easily uh, collapse to to a single mode, so that uh, it, it will, for example, gen generate a single image right every time. Uh, to address this problem, uh, here comes the double game model, uh, was a stain game model. Uh, in this work, um, the authors show that uh, if the data if the data are on a low dimensional uh, manifold of a high dimensional space, then the models manifold and the true data manifold can have negligible intersection in practice. What does this mean? Um, uh, imagine that we are modeling the image data, right? So a imi the raw image data space is, is a high dimensional space because we can have a very high resolution image, right? So the, 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 raw, the raw data space is very high dimensional. But uh, this image data are usually lying in a very low dimensional manifold. Because for example, we usually, like we can first extract a low dimensional feature right, from, from an input image, right? And use this feature to do like, a, like an image classification and other, other tasks, right? That means this, feature, this low dimensional feature can capture the most information encoded in the, in the, raw, data, uh, in, in the raw image. And uh, um, that means like we, we kind of uh, map the raw data in high dimensional low, raw data space to the, to the uh, low dimensional manifold, right? So um, that is our uh, image data satisfy this property. Uh, the, the data manifold is actually very low dimensional. And the, with, with this property, um, we can see um, the, the result is that the models, ma models manifold and the true data manifold can have ne negligible intersection. And this uh, further leads to this problem. Uh, with this uh, properties, we can see the KL divergence uh, between the models manifold, uh, models between the model distribution and the data distribution is usually undefined or, or can be like infinite. And uh, the loss function based on the KL divergence and, and its gradient right, can be like, uh, cannot be uh, uh, continuous or well behaved. So this is the case of, yeah. Why is the KL divergence undefined? Uh, so, because, uh, so here you can see like a KL divergence is defined as, um, Right, this, this is the KL divergence, right? And uh, if like P and Q are, don't have a, like an intersection, then at some point of, of, uh, in, in the X space, right? Like PX can be zero. So this is a, a intuition that uh, this KL divergence can be like, a, uh, can be undefined or in, infinite. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, with, with this uh, undefined KL divergence, right, the, the, the resulting loss function can, be, can also be undefined. So this is the, this is the case of, of, uh, of the base game model, right? 
like both the KL divergence and the uh, Jason Shannon divergence are defined, are defined uh, in terms of KL divergence. So how should we like um, address this problem? Um, so the intuition is that uh, now that KL divergence is undefined, but we can always find a, a different uh, measure, right? Because KL divergence is a measure between is a distance measure between two distributions, right? So here um, we can use a different distance measure between distributions, and here comes the water stem distance, which is also called like Earth movers distance. This is because um, this distance basically measures the minimum transportation cost from uh, from making like one pile of dirt in the shape of one prob probability probability distribution. Uh, to the shape of the other distribution. So basically, we want to measure this, uh, the, the difference between these two distributions, right? By, like, by transporting like, um, the probability assignment from, from, this, uh, from this x to the other x, right? So this is a, a, another distance measure between uh, two distance, uh, between two di distributions. And uh, uh, yeah, and then we can like replace this KL divergence objective with this new uh, distance objective. Right? And then uh, with some approximation, we can get this objective. Uh, this W is the water stand distance between like our uh, data distribution and the generative distribution. And the D again is the discriminator. And the, we can see this objective is still a minimax uh, objective, right? Because here we want to maximize this uh, this turn with regard to the discriminator, and we want to minimize this uh, distance, right? So, uh, with regard to the, the generator, right? Yeah, so, um, and uh, here there's an additional assumption that D has to be like a K Lipschitz continuous. L this can be achieved by like using, using like a gradient clipping. Yeah, so, this is the uh, new objective proposed by uh, Double Gang. And uh, uh, let's see the effect of this, uh, this objective by comparing, the, the, uh, by comparing with the, the base game model. Um, so here is the, the, the gradient of, of the two models. Right? So uh, this red curve is the gradient of, of the base game model with regard to the input x. We can see that um, with with true data, right, this gradient can quickly saturate to, to one. Right? And uh, with fake data, the gradient will vanish very quickly and very close to zero. So this, this quick, uh, very sharp change makes the gradient very unstable and uh, um, makes the chain very uh, ineffective. Kind of. But in comparison, right, uh, in W gain, we can see this gradient is like uh, is, is, is more like a meaningful, right? We can see uh, this gradient can like change, very, change gradually uh, in terms of this different x. So this basically shows that uh, the double game objective is kind of a better objective for this uh, adversarial modeling. Yeah, so uh, this is a very quick uh, introduction of double game, the, 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 the basic intuition behind this uh, new model. <laughs> Yeah. And uh, our next uh, progressive gain, uh, after double gain, right, uh, there are other like, uh, milestone models in, in game research that can really uh, improve the performance of like, image modeling. So a pro progressive gain is a representative technique. Uh, the intuition behind this model is, uh, is, is actually very simple and very straightforward. Our goal is like, to generate uh, high res resolution images, right? So uh, the intuition is here is that um, we first start with a very small discriminator and a very small, very small generator and a discriminator that can generate low resolution images. We first train this, this, this model and then uh, we gradually, like step, step by step, we add in more layers to this generator and the discriminator and increase the resolution of the image, of the image data. 
And this process goes on, and in the end, we can get a very large generator and a discriminator. And the, the, the resulting images are of high resolution. So this is basically a very simple and straightforward idea that we, we change the model kind of like, uh, in a progressive way. Uh, we basically like start with a very simple problem and uh, gradually improve, uh, increase the difficulty of this problem, and uh, in the end, we'll get the, uh, we'll adjust the problem of interest. Yeah, and uh, later on, uh, after this progressive gain, now uh, the state of art and the, the latest work is uh, is called big gain. So what is big gain? Uh, this, this is actually already indicated in this name. This is basically just a very big game model. So in, in this work, the authors show that games can benefit dramatically from scaling. In particular, they, uh, they use a, a large model with like a two times or four times more parameters in the generator, and they train this model with eight times larger batch size. And with with like simple architecture changes that improve the scalability of the uh, of the model training kind of, and with these simple like uh, checks, uh, this model can 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 create images that are very like realistic and very amazing. Like um, you can hardly tell like whether these are true images or is 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 uh, they are based on they are generated from the game model. And here are more results. Yeah, so uh, we can see this, this idea is pretty simple. Right? Uh, we basically, like, we do not change the like, training objectives or like, the, the training schedule. Right? We basically just like, increase the, the model size. Uh, this idea, this, this kind of idea, like scaling up the model and get to improve the results uh, is actually not, not uncommon these days. Right? For example, uh, in, in previous lecture, we have seen like BERT. BERT is a very, very large like, uh, text generation model, or text representation model. We, we train a very large transformer model uh, on a very large data set, and the, the resulting model can like, uh, extract text features that are really like, effective for downstream tasks. Right? And the bigger game model is just another instance that uh, by scaling up a model, we can like, get improved results. Okay, so this is a, a very quick uh, review of the uh, representative techniques in the game research line. Yeah, okay, um, let's move on to the second part, the uh, normalizing flow, a, a new type of uh, deep generative models that has attracted like, uh, some research interest recently. So what is normalizing flow? Uh, a normalizing flow is basically a uh, basically transforms a simple distribution into a complex distribution by applying a sequence of transformation functions. So here's a uh, visualization of this process. We start with a very simple uh, distribution, like right, uh, like a a unit Gaussian kind of. Uh, you, and then uh, we apply a sequence of transformation functions, F1, like F2, and to like uh, Fk. Right? And uh, uh, in the end, we can like, uh, in this process, we can like uh, increase the complexity of this distribution. Right? And in the end, we can basically get whatever uh, distribution you want. Here's another example in practice. Right? Uh, start Starting with this unit Gaussian, right? Um, we apply these transformation functions and get like more and more modes in this dis distribution, and uh, in the end, we get this distribution. Right? And uh, likewise, in in the uniform case, we get uh, we start from this and uh, uh, we get this. Okay, so um, formally, let's first uh, take a look at the the, the simplicity case. We use only use a single transformation function. Right? So here, z is the uh, latent, the latent variable. Uh, latent variable. Uh, here, p can be like a, a unique Gaussian distribution, right? and the x is the feasible variable you want to model. And the f is the transformation function. With with this uh, 
generative model, right? Uh, a, a key operation of deep generative model, as we know, is the inference, right? We want to inf infer the latent variable given a data point x. Right? So how, how can we do with this formulation? Uh, we can um, assume some, uh, we can make some assumption uh, in terms of this transformation function. We assume this function is invertible. Then uh, the latent inference is simply applying the invert function on this data point x. Right? So with this assumption, we can basically do exact inference right, for, for this latent variable. And uh, besides this, the second uh, most common like, operation for deep generative model is to evaluate the, li the likelihood of a data point or like a sample from a distribution. Right? Then um, with, with this formulation, we can see like uh, the density of, this, of x is defined like this, like based on the change of variable theorem. Basically, this is a, uh, the distribution of z times the uh, Jacobian determinant. Right? And to make this computation efficient, we make a second assumption. That is, uh, the transformation function on uh, its Jacobian dis uh, determinant is easy to compute. For example, we can choose certain types of uh, transformation function so that um, the, the Jacobian uh, matrix uh, is a triangular matrix. This makes this can guarantee like this determinant is very easy to compute. So uh, with these two assumptions, we can do like an exact inference, right? And we can evaluate this density or like a likelihood uh, in an exact way, right? And also like sampling from this distribution is pretty straightforward. This is the uh, main idea behind this normalizing flow model. And uh, uh, what if we want to get a very complex uh, distribution? As we, as we see, we have seen that we can apply a sequence of transformation functions, right? starting with uh, this z0, a very simple distribution. Uh, we apply a sequence of functions, f1 to fk, and we get the final uh, output variable, which can be like a, can basically follow whatever distribution you want. But, and uh, we, for each of these transformation functions, we make the same assumption, right? which is uh, invertible and uh, uh, easy to compute Jacob, uh, Jacobian determinant. And how do we train this model? Uh, because we can evaluate this data likelihood, right? Then uh, the objective is pretty straightforward. We just maximize this data log likelihood, right? So, uh, this is the advantage of normalizing flow compared to other deep generative models. For example, on in GAN, right? In GAN, we cannot evaluate this likelihood, likelihood right? Because a GAN model is a is an implicit model. Uh, so, so in GAN, we have to like assume an additional like discriminator, right, to help with this training. But here, because we can evaluate this likelihood, we can directly min uh, optimize this this objective. And also compared to version of the encoder, right? In version of the encoder, uh, data log likelihood is also uh, intractable. Right? So that we have to like uh, assume a version of distribution and use the version of uh, principle to uh, optimize the version of lower bound instead of this data log likelihood. Right? But here, uh, in normalizing flow, we can do like exact inference and the exact evaluation of this uh, likelihood. So we can like, do a chaining and the inference pretty straightforward. Uh, yeah. So is the problem in that we need is that the transformation function is not Because it's in the same form, right? You sample from some simple distribution in the right distribution. Yeah, so yeah, you in GAN and the version of the encoder, we do not make these assumptions, right? Like a, which is invertible or like a easy to compute the determinant. Yeah, but here uh, we do have some constraint like for this transformation function in terms uh, to like satisfy these two assumptions. Right. Yeah, so uh, this, is, this is the uh, basic uh, principles underlying the trans uh, normalizing flow. And the glow is the, uh, the latest uh, model uh, instance 
uh, in this research line. Basically, uh, this, this, this work assume uh, formulated a particular type of the transformation function, which consists of an uh, activation normalization and uh, like an invertible convolution, and then a, a fine coupling layer. Right? And with this uh, transformation function, um, we, we can get these results, like our, we can get the images, which are pretty, uh, 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 the quality is pretty good, but uh, compared to like, a, like a previous like game models, like we have seen like a bigger game, right? these, these results are still like not that great, but uh, this is, uh, because this research line is pretty, like, uh, pretty new, so uh, I think down the road we may see like more advanced uh, normalizing flow models that can produce better better images and other other other, other data. You know. Okay, so uh, this is a pretty uh, a pretty quick um, introduction of this uh, normalizing flow model. Um, any questions here? Oh uh, yeah, so for generative model, right? Um, so this is actually a general question, like applied to any like generative models. So uh, for generative model, what's the applications? There, are, there are many of there are many applications. Like uh, first of all, like in game, like we can generate like images or like like text, right? And also like uh, if we can somehow like do conditional generation, which we'll uh, cover in the next lecture. So that uh, we can control the properties. For example, we can control the identity of the of the image of, of the face image, right? Or if, say if we can control the, the category of the, of the generated image, right? the, the generated ob object uh, object in the image, then we can do like a for example data augmentation, right? Give we can like given a label, we can generate the image, right? And this image and the label pair can be used to train a classifier, right? And also, like uh, we can do some like uh, basically many applications. Like uh, say you want to design a like a, a table, for example, right? And uh, you may like uh, draw inspirations from the model. Right? You you just ask the model to generate the, to generate the table for you. And uh, based on this this image, you can do like some modification and like uh, you may basically like design a new table. Right? right. And also uh, other uh, uh, another application is that um, in generative models we want to do like a latent inference, right? So this latent inference is usually like basically we want to extract features from from the data, right? Z is the, basically the, the features, right? So generative model can allow us to do like this uh, feature learning using an unsupervised learning method, right? Because we don't need like any labels for this data, right? We just model this data distribution, and we can get the uh, get a fun kind of a, a inference function like uh, which extracts z given x. Right? So this z can serve as the as the feature and uh, can be used for like 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 other tasks like classification and everything. <clears throat> okay, so um, then uh, let's move on to the third part. This is a very interesting topic of like integrating domain knowledge into deep or uh, into deep learning. Okay, so uh, in deep learning, right, um, deep learning usually has uh, some like uh, drawbacks. Uh, for example, uh, deep neural networks usually relies on massive label data. Like right? we have to train a, a, a new networks on on a, on a large set of label data in a, in a supervised in a supervised manner, right? And this model is usually like uh, uninterpretable. And uh, it's really hard to encode human intention and the domain knowledge into these models, right, into these black box models. And in comparison, how do, uh, how do humans learn? Right? Humans learn from uh, concrete examples as, the, as deep neural networks do. Right? But also, uh, we learn from abstract knowledge. For example, we can learn from explicit definitions of a concept, 
we can also learn from uh, logical rules. Right? So here is an example. Um, how do we learn this uh, uh, passive tense of verbs? Right? We learn this uh, not by like uh, only memorizing memorizing these examples, right? Uh, like add, add it, and uh, accept, accept it, right? Instead, we have this uh, very simple but effective rule, right? Uh, by adding d and ed, like uh, after this uh, of a regular verb, we can get it. We can get get their past tense, kind of. Right? So this rule is pretty simple, but it is very effective to to explain or to define this uh, linguistic phenomenon. Right? So this is a, a, a motivating uh, example. Like, um, can we like incorporate such rules into neural networks to improve their learning and improve their like generalization ability? So uh, let's consider a, a statistical model X, uh, uh, P Z X. So this this model can be like. A, Basically, whatever model you want, like uh, it can be a conditional model. For example, here x can condition on like uh, uh, some inputs. This can be a generative model. If here like x is an image, like right? this is a generative model. This can also be a discriminative model. If if x is a, like a sentence label, right? And if this model is like depend on some like input sentence, right? So we 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 just like formulate this model as as p theta. And we con we consider a constrained function, uh, f phi. This function is a real real valued function uh, with a higher f value. Uh, a higher value indicates a better x with regard to uh, some some knowledge. So we basically like a, um, express knowledge in uh, as a as a constrained function. And here is a, here is an example. Um, so this is, this is a common task in computer vision, giving a source image of a person right, and a, a target pose, which is expressed as a as a key as a key points uh, of the pose. We want to generate a new image that uh, is like in this pose, with regard to uh, the same with the target pose, but it's still of the same person. Right? And uh, we want to have a generative model to generate this, this, uh, this image, which is close to this true ground truth. Right? So for, for this model training, we can do like supervised learning. Right? We just minimize this distance between the generated image and the true image. Right? But uh, besides this uh, supervision signal, we actually have some like, uh, domain knowledge in terms of this, to uh, in terms of this problem. Right? In particular, uh, we know, like we know, the human human body structure. Right? We we know, like uh, this is the head, this is the this is the arms, and uh, this is the body, right? And and the legs. We know this uh, this structure of human body. Right? So we can add some structured constraint here. Um, we want um, the generated image, uh, the person in this image, has the same uh, body structure with the, uh, the, the with, with this uh, in in the true image, right? We can basically uh, impose this structured constraint, uh, structured consistency image uh, constraint on, on this model, kind of. Right, and even better, um, here basically we need a human part parser, right, to like pass this uh, image into its like uh, kind of a human body segmentation, so that we can evaluate this consist consistency, right. And here, even better, we can like uh, adapt this human puzzle jointly with this generative model during during the model training, so that uh, these two parts can like uh, together improve the performance of the whole system. So here, uh, this model is the model of interest, uh, this p theta, and this part is the constraint, which consists uh, which uh, forms this uh, constraint function. Yeah, this is a, a, a application scenario of this uh, of this setting, and the second uh, application that are different from the image data. Here we want to like a uh, classification on text data. Say we want to like sentiment classification. Right? Given a sentence like uh, this was a terrific movie, but the director could have done better. 
we have a linguistic knowledge about this uh, sentiment, right? It's especially like a, if a sentence S is uh, with the structure like A but B, right? Uh, a but B, then we know that the sentiment of the of the B part will dominate the sentiment of the whole sentence, right? This is a, a very simple like a linguistic phenomenon. Right, so uh, can we like uh, incorporate incorporate this logical rule in, into a neural network to like uh, improve the efficiency of learning? You know? Okay, so uh, here comes the methodology. Uh, one way to impose this constraint is to maximize this uh, objective. Right, you can see uh, basically this objective says that a sample from this uh, generative from this model p theta must sat satisfy this constrained function, right? must like, maximize this is, is value. You can imagine this is very uh, similar to the game model. Right? You can see this is the generator and this is the discriminator, basically. And uh, uh, we have this objective. We want to minimize these this, this two terms. Here, L is the regular objective, the regular loss in, uh, for example, it can be a cross entropy loss, right, in, in classification. This is a regular objective. And we additionally add this uh, term as a regularization to impose this constraint. Right? But the difficulty here is that um, this term can sometimes um, be very difficult to compute. Right. Uh, this, this term is uh, computable when like, P theta is a simple implicit model, as in games. Right? Or like, P theta is an explicit model uh, that is like, reparameterizable. For example, in inversion of the encoder, right, we, we usually see like, this as a, like, a, like a Gaussian distribution, right, which is pretty simple, but it's reparameterizable, so that we can like, compute this gradient with regard to theta. But in, in most of the cases, like say P theta is a, like a explicit distribution, a very complex distribution that uh, does not have like a very uh, straightforward reparameterization, then uh, this computing this, this term is pretty uh, difficult. So what should, I, what should we do like, to uh, address this problem? Yeah, given, given this uh, objectives, right? Or, the idea is that we can apply our like variational principle to like reformulate reformulate this this uh, this objective to like basically uh, approximate it. Um, here we introduce a variational distribution Q, right, and we impose the cons the constraint on Q, right? And we additionally encourage Q to stay close to P. So this is the, indeed this is the standard versional principle, right? To to approximate a expectation, right? And this formulation is very relevant to like posterior regularization, which was uh, invented like a, a couple a couple of years ago. Yeah, and now the objectives comes uh, like this. This is the regular objectives, and we add this versional objectives here. Right, and we minimize these two together. And we will see like uh, uh, this objective is pretty easy to like optimize. How, sh how should we optimize this? Uh, we can use EM algorithm, right? We are already like familiar with this uh, algorithm. So in each step, we optimize this objective in, with regard to uh, Q, right? With regard to the version of distribution. And uh, here, uh, because this objective uh, is is convex in in terms of Q, right? So we can get a close to so close to form solution for Q. Uh, in this form, we can see that um, here uh, the constrained function, right? A higher value of the constrained fun function will lead to a higher probability on the Q, right? So this constraint is basically a, a soft constraint, and then. Uh, in the end step, we optimize this objective with regard to the model parameter theta, right? So uh, we just pick the relevant terms, L, L theta, and, uh, and, and this term, the KL divergence term, right? And which uh, is equivalent to minimizing uh, this term, you kind know. Of. Uh, 
here. Uh, yeah, this is some kind of like a. You, uh, you, you may you may want to like refer this ref, uh, relevant paper because um, it, it does involve some like mathematical like uh, operations. But uh, basically, the key idea is like you want to use like a uh, like regression multiplier method to like to solve this problem basically. Right. And the paper, yeah, you you can see this paper. All right. Okay, so um, yeah, so the M step basically minimizes this uh, this objective in terms of uh, with regard to theta, and we will see like uh, what does this mean or uh, in some in, in a specific uh, application. So here is the application. Now we consider a, a particular uh, use case of this framework. Right? Uh, we consider a supervised learning problem. Now the model is P theta y given x. For example, like x is a sentence, right? and y is a, is a sentiment label. And so, so the input and the target space is x and y. And here we consider the constraints. Like, uh, the constraint is now our first order logical rules. Here, uh, our xy is, the, is, a, is a rule, uh, which kind of returns a truth value of, of, of this rule. Right? And this rule can be solved by using like a uh, soft soft formulation of uh, of the logics. And the lambda is the confidence level of the rule. And uh, uh, based on the framework we just developed, uh, given L rules, uh, the each step is like this: right? the the solution of this uh, rational distribution. Here, uh, we will replace the the general F constraint with this uh, logical rules. Right? And the M step, M step is, is, is the same, right? We we minimize this objective. And it turns out that it turns out that uh, in this in this uh, application, this objective is equivalent to is very close uh, to knowledge knowledge distillation, uh, which was invented like a, a couple of years ago, a couple of years ago. Uh, what is knowledge distillation? Um, let's take a, a quick review of this, this technique. So assume we have a model, right? Uh, we have a model of interest, like, uh, like the model P theta x, uh, y given x. We call this model as a student model. And uh, uh, assume we have another set of models, which, which are called the teacher model, like, like the Q, uh, Q model. Uh, in, in knowledge distillation, this, you, uh, this teacher model is usually an uh, ensemble of a, a set of models. And uh, we use this teacher model to train this student model. The key idea is that uh, we want to match, we want to match uh, the soft predictions of the teacher networks and the student network. So basically, the idea is that we want to like, train the student net network to mimic the prediction behavior of the teacher network. Right. This is the uh, intuition behind the uh, knowledge distillation. And uh, uh, how does it relate to our framework? Uh, here we can see uh, with, with this objective right, in, in M step. And uh, this is the neural network of interest, which is the student model. And we train this model to emit, emit Basically, this term um, is to train this model to imitate the outputs of the of the teacher of the teacher network. So here uh, at the iteration t, um, this is the regular objective, right? Um, say this is the true hard label in the data, and this is the soft prediction of the of the of the student model, right? And uh, for example, here this L is the cross entropy loss. Right? This is the uh, regular term. And the second term, uh, if we expand this, uh, this term into this form, then uh, here S is the soft prediction of the teacher network. Right? Here teacher network is the, is the Q function, is the, is the Q distribution, uh, which kind of like it combines the, the model of interest and the logical rules together. 
Right. And uh, here we basically minimize the distance between the uh, soft prediction of the teacher model and the soft prediction of the student model. Right. So we can see this is the, uh, this is the same uh, with the knowledge distillation method. Right. And to combine these two objectives, we can somehow introduce some like balancing parameters. Like, we, we can tune these parameters to like balance between these two objectives. Okay, so yeah, so here our ensemble is are in, in the traditional like knowledge distillation or setting. Like here, knowledge because knowledge distillation was first proposed to like uh, uh, compress this ensemble to a, a single model. This is the original setting, but here uh, we kind of adapt this framework to like uh, inject knowledge from uh, logical rules to the new network. But the idea is still the same. We we use a teacher network and a student network to do this uh, knowledge transfer kind of. Okay, so this is the, our framework. Given given new network, right? At at each iteration, basically we first construct a teacher network with solved constraints, right? This is the 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 E step, right? Our or intuitively, we can see this. This process is, is basically like uh, we have a new, we have this model, right? And we we have these logical rules which defines a subspace of the model, and uh, we project this uh, model to this subspace to get this Q, uh, this Q distribution, right? the, the teacher network, and then uh, we change this this model to emu uh, emulate the teacher networks right? by minimizing the the loss function between the output of the teacher network and the output of the student network. And there are an, another advantage of this, pro, of this algorithm is that because the teacher network does not really need the real data right, from, from, from the label data, uh, from, uh, need the real labels from the data. Right? So we can additionally use unlabeled data sets. Right? We use, we present, uh, we use the unlabeled data sets and use the teacher network to do prediction on top of, of this data. And we can minimize this uh, distance between teachers and the students, right? So basically, uh, we can enable like semi supervised learning. Okay, so uh, this is the uh, framework of integrating like logical rules or integrating whatever constraints to a neural network. Right? But in practice, um, at some point, at some time, uh, uh, the, the logical rules can, can be like, uh, not that correct, right? Maybe, maybe some of the, these rules are, are wrong, actually, right? And uh, maybe some, some rules are not applicable some, to some like, uh, uh, data set or to some like, uh, data points. So uh, ideally, can we learn uh, a confidence value for each of these logical rules, right? Which kind of like weight these different uh, rules so that uh, we can pick uh, the most important or most like correct rules to improve the performance. But um, in in some of our, uh, in our previous work, we we uh, did the research. Uh, we proposed a method to learn the confidence value lambda for each of the logical rules, right? Uh, and the more generally, can we uh, optimize the parameters of the constraints, right? Uh, associated with the constraints, uh, associated with, with this f, f function. So let's uh, say uh, for a knowledge, right, please. Let me finish your sentence. Okay, yeah, so uh, in practice, uh, say uh, in, a, in a constrained function, right, we may cannot like, specify everything. For example, here or in, in, in this in this constraint, right? We have like a human parser, right? But we may not able to like specify this whole human parser, so we can just put it uh, make it as a as a learn, learnable module. Or for example, a neural net a neural network, and can we learn this uh, constraint function, right? Constraint uh, jointly with this uh, whole framework. So uh, in, in in this framework, uh. In our previous work, we we can somehow do this uh, by like treating these uh, constraints as a as a reward function in reinforcement learning, 
but and uh, we can use some like a reinforcement learning method to learn this reward function. Yeah, please. Fuzzy, uh, yeah, so fuzzy logic, um, yeah, here, so for, for fuzzy logic, right, so you, we, you basically like use, just use these uh, rules to do this, uh, the whole problem, right, you, you just use these rules to do like a uh, prediction, right, but here our main goal is to, like to incorporate these rules in a neural network and we transfer this structural knowledge into a neural network parameters, so that this neural network can like do better learning now. Yeah, because here you can, uh, in a real problem, right, you really cannot like, specify like, uh, enough rules to like, address, a, address a real problem. Right? So basically, this, this framework allows you to like, uh, train a new network to do the, to do the problem, but uh, you can add whatever knowledge you have uh, into, into this model like, to improve the performance. What? Can you just look at those as like side experts or something? Can you speak louder? Can you look at those as side experts? Like in, uh, for example, I realize we're using neural nets specifically, but like in generalized weighted majority, right? Uh, you would look at each one of your uh, logical rules as an expert and then weight them appropriately and force them to be modeled. Yeah, so, yeah, so basically, yeah, this framework is like um, an expert can like provide whatever knowledge they have, right? But uh, uh, the user do not need to like know everything, right? They just like uh, provide whatever uh, they know, so that uh, like and provide these logical rules to to this to this system and uh, uh, to somehow improve this model, kind of. What? Are there going to be references to those methods at the end? Oh, uh, sorry. We can talk about yeah, we can talk about applying. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, yeah, uh, I won't dive into the details of this uh, this method because here uh, we involve like reinforcement learning, uh, which is the topic of next few uh, lectures. Yeah, so uh, with this framework, with this methodology, right, um, let's see some applications. So we have seen this application, right, uh, given an image of a person and a target post, we want to generate a new image uh, of the new post. And we add this constraint that uh, make sure, to make sure that like, uh, the human body structure uh, can match. And here are some results uh, of this framework. You can see that given this uh, input, right, um, we can somehow get the results, which are pretty close to this uh, to, to, uh, to this one truth. Uh, and compared to other models, like the base models without this constraint, um, we can see uh, the performance is much better. And uh, both this uh, human evaluation and other uh, evaluation shows that uh, with constraints, you can get kind of a better result. And here is another application. Uh, the task is that um, given a template, given a template, we want to generate a complete sentence uh, that follows this template. So the, prob the, the task is basically uh, we want to fill in these uh, slots in these templates and get a complete sentence. And the, const the constraint is pretty simple. Um, we force the match between the inferring content of the generated sentence with the true content. Right? And we specify a matching module, right? which is the uh, part of the constraint function. So uh, we, we train this model uh, with the within the framework and get this results. Here, you can see like uh, this sentence is uh, generated by the model. You can see uh, we can get pretty decent results. Right? And compared to uh, the base model, uh, the base model can like, the results of the base model are pretty like, uh, not, not very realistic. You can like 10 out of 10, like, and like, the acting is the acting, right? 
but our model can do like uh, the acting is also very good. And also our list, this result show that um, with this constraint, we can really get better results. Okay, so this is uh, the key takeaways of this uh, of this lecture. We have uh, seen, yeah, we, we did a recap of the general, uh, of the game model, and uh, we see uh, some representative techniques like uh, WGAN, which propose a new learning objective. And uh, we see the progressive gain, right, which basically propose a new training schedule of the model. And uh, a big gain, which shows that our scaling up gain model can get a uh, pretty uh, amazing results. And uh, we see like uh, normalizing flow, a new type of divergentive models. We, in this model, we basically like a, trains, a sequence of transformation functions. And this model can permit uh, exact latent inference and uh, like a density evaluation and uh, and the sampling, right? right and uh, in the third part, we uh, we st we study this uh, topic of integrating domain knowledge with deep le with deep learning. Right? We basically express domain knowledge as constraints, and uh, we we use uh, like a variational principle like to to uh, make this problem easy to uh, easy to uh, solve, and uh, um, we can also like learn these constraints or these logical rules jointly with 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 this model. Yeah, so this is the three parts, and uh, uh, in the in the next lecture we will discuss uh, some use case about like a uh, text generation, and uh, we will see this uh, this framework again. Like uh, we can somehow generalize this framework to like a uh, to enable more applications, basically. Okay, so yeah, this is the content of this lecture. Any questions? Okay, cool. Uh, thanks 